Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, January 24th, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Aaron Swindlin, and special co host, Arthur Hill. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show, and we hope to see you back. And for our regulars, welcome back. All right, so let's take a peek at what has been going on in the market so far. All righty. Okay, so what I was noting uh, today so far, uh, Dow Industrials, you can see, are up slightly. We started up for the day. Um, hang on, let me make sure this is right. There we go. That looks better. All right. Okay, so uh, the Dow is up slightly right now. You can see uh, S&P 500, same. We're really traveling mostly sideways. It was a little bit volatile earlier, uh, but right now we're near intraday highs. Uh, NASDAQ, same. Uh, S&P 400, actually having a good day, started off rising and is continuing to rise. And Russell 2000 as well. All right. The uh, TSX is up slightly. You can see that Treasury yields are down right now, currently reading 2.714%. The VIX is slightly lower, reading 1915. UUP, the dollar way up right now, up 13 cents to 25.63 for UUP. Gold is down slightly, uh, 10 cents, reading 121.18 for GLD. USO is up, spent most of the morning moving sideways and is now moving upward and did surpass the previous high from yesterday. TLT gapped up, but is now trading mostly sideways. All right. Arthur, welcome to the show. Thank you hey. for being my co-host today. Hey, no problem. I'm glad to be here. It's always nice to chip in uh, when Tom takes a break, because I know he's working hard. You are too. Oh, well, thank you. No, it's uh, it's excellent. I know uh, everybody likes it when you come on, so I'm very happy to have you here helping us out today. All right, well, let's look at the upcoming schedule and what we're going to cover today. And as you can see, uh, what's hot, what's not is going to be happening for us on Friday tomorrow, and I will be co-hosting for Tom as well. And Greg Schnell is going to be in next week, followed by uh, my workshop, which will be on Tuesday. So uh, I think I'm going to continue uh, with the building blocks of technical analysis. I think I'll do a part two. And then Dr. Alexander Elder will be here on Wednesday. Very much looking forward to talking to him. For today's agenda, uh, Arthur's going to be breaking down the tech ETFs uh, so that it should be really interesting. I know you're going to be talking about semiconductors in particular. Then we're going to move on into the 10 in 10. Our first symbol is going to be Coca-Cola, K-O. And then we're going to finish off with a segment we're going to call Chart Conundrums. Uh, Arthur and I are going to look at a couple of charts and chart patterns and let's uh, give our opinions on what the chart should be doing and what the chart is doing. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with some technical news and headlines. We're gonna go ahead and I'll start off with the uh, economic reports. Uh, jobless claims did decline for the week uh, to 199,000. An increase was actually expected. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why they're saying uh, this happened. And you know, one of them is that they, that, uh, that employers are actually kind of reluctant to fire workers um, just because it's the strength is overshadowing the shutdown, which is affecting about 25% of government workers. And they're saying that maybe the next time around, we'll see the effects of the shutdown if things aren't cleared up, uh, if, the, if we get more uh, claims coming in by uh, government workers who might be needing that. All right, some key earnings that we wanna look at today as well. And as you can see, um, Citrix came in above expectations. Ford was right on par. Uh, F5 Networks, nice big beat. And LAM Research, also a nice beat. 387 versus 367 that was expected. Uh, Texas Instrument also uh, Instruments also had a beat at 127 versus 124 expected. 
And then after the bell today, a couple of big ones we're going to want to pay attention to are Discover, uh, Intel, and ISRG, Intuitive Surgical, and of course, uh, Starbucks, S box. Let's go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up our sector summary so that I can give you a, a feel of what's going on right now as far as the leaders going today. So right now, uh, top of the leaderboard is actually the energy sector. I know a lot's being made uh, uh, about the fact that the markets are up right now, really on the back of technology, which is true. Technology is up almost 1% right now, but the energy sector is actually the, up over one and a quarter percent. So if you want to drill down just to see which one uh, industry groups are the leaders as far as these sectors, you can just click on it from the sector summary. And now we have all of the energy sector industry groups. And as you can see, that renewable energy is really kicking it. Uh, we're up over four and a quarter percent or four and a third percent right now for renewable energy and equipment. And then oil equipment and services are also one of the leaders, but not quite as uh, as uh, crazy as what's going on with renewable energy, but it is up almost two and a quarter percent right now. Some of the big stocks in here that you might wanna pay attention to. Uh, right now, as you can see, we've got uh, Rensola is the one that's leading with a move of over 9%. Uh, some of the ones that I was interested in looking at, uh, Solar Edge was one, SEDG. And here we go. And you can see a really nice uh, pop today. Uh, we didn't get a gap up, but really nice move to the upside. It's up almost over five per five and a half percent, which is what we saw on the industry group summary stocks. I like seeing that the PMO is now in positive territory, so that's looking good as well. We do have overhead resistance, though, in the shorter term that's lining up just above 4250. Uh, and of course, the 200 day EMA is actually going to come up even before that as a test of overhead resistance. I suspect we'll see uh, possibly a, a little bit of a, a stop at that 200 day EMA or at that overhead resistance area at 4250. Uh, and then then I, th I would look for a breakout. Uh, I think that this is looking pretty good if that 20 pop passes the 50 day EMA, that would give us a decision point buy signal in the intermediate term. We already had gotten the buy signal for the short term trend when the five day EMA crossed above the 20 day EMA that gave us that buy signal. And that coincided pretty much uh, right with that PMO buy signal. So we had some, we did get some, uh, some attention flags there before this big pop today. So I uh, always like to point out when our, our models are doing well. All right, but let's go ahead and look a little bit at technology. I know you're going to be covering it, Arthur, so I don't want to get too into it. But a couple of these uh, semiconductors are certainly leading the charge in the tech sector up over five and a quarter percent, uh, but up two and a quarter percent is electrical components and equipment. Uh, since I know you're going to look at some semiconductors, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a few of these electrical components stocks. All right, uh, Resonant uh, Incorporated, R-E-S-N, is clearly the leader up over 18.5%. Um, this one is typically low, somewhat low volume, but you can see a nice pop that actually has covered up the gap today that we saw back in November. Uh, the PM, uh, we're seeing a 20, 50 day EMA crossover just about coming in, which would give an intermediate term buy signal. I am a little bit concerned looking at the PMO. It looks overbought, but I want to make sure it truly is overbought because I see some readings here uh, down at minus 20. But I suspect that's not really the range that we normally will see for uh, resonant. Okay. So really when you're looking at the typical range, you know, you could actually say the minus 20 to 20, but you can see just looking at the daily range for the PMO, we are in overbought territory. Uh, and and so we have to be, be aware of that. And that tells me that, you know, we may need that pause at uh, resistance. Let's go back to the one that is daily. 
And resistance, where is resistance? I'm looking at it at just over $3.50. So could be a big mover, might be a, a quick play, um, but be aware that momentum is great, but it is overbought right now. And go back more. All right. Kemet was one of the other ones that I was going to show you right now. All right. And as you can see, PMO buy signal uh, was in place earlier in the month. And we've got the 50 is still below the 200. And I should have made a little bit of warning on that on the last chart. When you have a 50 below the 200, you do have a, kind of a, a bearish configuration. And you don't always want to expect the bullish outcome because a lot of times it just won't happen. And and the odds are kind of against you if the 50 is below the 200. So I always give a little bit of warning there. But I do like the breakout. 200-day uh, EMA certainly would be the next area of overhead resistance. But the strongest one, I'd say, is about 22 uh, to 2250. That does match up nicely with this low back in August. And the tops back here from November and December. So 2250 to 23 would be the next area of overhead resistance if we can get a continuation here. These are in the tech sector though. And so I am a little bit um, cautious about them because I do still have a, a bearish stance. And let me go show you why I have my bearish stance here. All right, let's go ahead. I'm gonna pull down and we'll look at the Dow daily chart. All right. Uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to start off with this S&P chart. I think that would be the best one to look at right now. All right. So we had the rising wedge. Uh, I was uh, I, I was more interested in the rising bottoms trend line because uh, I don't like when wedges get that mature because you usually, you know, you can drift out of it. And we kind of did drift out of it rather than a big breakdown. But we are still outside of that uh, rising bottoms trend line. Probably can now draw a new one. Uh, but the 50-day EMA so far is holding up. And yes, we do have a nice move here on the PMO. But we were already starting to see some deceleration right after this move. And so that has me a little bit concerned. But overall, I'm looking for a uh, price to at least get down back down to test that 2600 level. Uh, Carl and I have talked about it. We can still remain in a bear market and still get a bounce to, you know, 2800. Uh, just beware, you know, as you've been seeing, we get these big rallies and then you're going to end up, you know, the next day uh, with hat in hand because everything went uh, the exact opposite in a very volatile manner. So while this chart is looking pretty good, uh, we got a little drift uh, off that rising bottoms trend line. I'm still, like I said, I'm still looking for 2,600 uh, given the strength of the PMO. And if it does get into positive territory, we might end up seeing a bounce there. Uh, but overall, I would still expect some downside for the S&P and looking at the weekly chart, you can see how important that 2600 level is. Did you, uh, did you already vote, Aaron? Yeah, I haven't voted yet. <laughs> yes, there is a poll. Don't influence about the that. voting, huh? <laughs> I don't want to skew it. <laughs> I think what's really interesting, though, is my weekly PMO is bottoming, uh, which gives uh, you know credence to the fact we could see a bounce off 2600. But uh, you know, I don't think we'd be completely out of the woods at that point in time. So. That's what I had for mine. And since I do have this uh, chart up, I do want to give you credit, Arthur, because of our, you know, our bloggers out there, um, you were the first really very early on to call this as a bear market. And you went out on a big limb to do that. <laughs> but oh, you were first. mid October. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, the indicators just aligned, at least the ones I was using. Sometimes you get lucky and you use the right indicators. <laughs> right? Well, I'm a, I've been, you know, really stuck on the monthly chart for me as far as the bear market is concerned because we got that sell signal and as I've as I've said, we've only had like 20 to 21 sell signals in 90 years. Wow. And so when you get one, uh, you kind of have to pay attention. So until uh, Carl and I are are of the opinion that, you know, until we start to see at least some deceleration or maybe a bottoming, 
on the monthly PMO, we're, we're in bear market mode. So. Yeah, that, that monthly signal is like a, a tanker. It, that can't turn around quickly. You know, it's going to take a while to turn around. Mm -hmm. But if you, yeah, when you start to see some deceleration, you know, that's going to give you uh, an idea that if we're coming off of a bottom and, and starting that rise, that maybe it's going to turn into something else and maybe we'll get a buy signal later on. But yeah, I, right now it's pointing straight down. So um, not liking it. I'm going to pass it back to you, Arthur, though, uh, to do the upgrades and downgrades. And then I know you've got your segment to get into. Okay, I'm going to grab the screen here. So I've got uh, four upgrades and four downgrades, and Tom is going to be um, sad he missed this one because I know this is a stock that he follows quite a bit. It's Insight Pharmaceuticals. It's a biotech, and it certainly acts like one. And you can see that it, you know, it had the big gap down in April and then traded basically flat for several months and looks like it was drifting lower and then got this big surge. And this is a big breakout. I mean, it is broken uh, above the spring and summer highs there. And it's not a 52-week high, uh, but above the 200-day moving average and kind of consolidating now, kind of a consolidation after a surge. So it looks like it could move higher. And it had two upgrades, one from buy to hold and one from market perform to outperform. Then we have Procter & Gamble. Now, these are kind of the funny upgrades, you know, from sell to hold. And so it's been on a sell recommendation here, and it's just moved higher. I don't know how long that sell recommendation was in, but Procter & Gamble has moved from 70 to 96, and now it has been upgraded from sell to hold. Uh, had a gap up. This is after earnings. So I, as far as a pattern, yeah, maybe short term you watch the gap. Uh, but really, probably there's a support zone in here to watch. And the trend's pretty good as long as that support zone there is holding. Then we have Southern Company. It's a utility, and it was upgraded from sell to neutral. Another one of those funny upgrades. You know, it's not very confident if you're just going to neutral. Uh, but Southern, you know, is close to a 52-week high, and it's been in a range for most of the past year, all of the past year. So it's coming into resistance there from that 52 week high. Kimberly Clark was upgraded from underweight to equal weight and it is part of the consumer staples sector. And what we can see maybe here is maybe some sort of a, an in, not an inverse head and shoulders, but a little bit of a cup with handle type pattern they're working as it consolidates. And if you look at just the right side of that, basically you have some sort of a, maybe a triangle forming if he can get a bounce off of this low here to put in that low. So overall a positive chart, but not a very convincing upgrade. Now looking at the downgrades, we got from buy to hold on Weibo. And Weibo is clearly in a downtrend big move down. And this is just a consolidation within a downtrend. You know, maybe it's some sort of a triangle, descending triangle, what have you. It's trying to break down, but, uh, you know, stay away from this one. It's at a 52-week low, so probably deserve that downgrade. Mondelez, another consumer staples stock, uh, kind of been going nowhere for a year. I mean, there's that line around 42 and it's been above and below that level several times but now it's above and i'd say the cup is half full for mondelez then we got another uh upgrade from vale compagna vale de rio can't pronounce that quite right but from neutral to underweight uh, but the stock doesn't look that bad uh, it's been, you know, pretty flat, but if I look at it, you know, we can see some, some higher lows working there and some higher highs. And there was a downswing here, and it looks like it's broken out of that. So it's in the midst of an upswing despite the downgrade. And as I'm sure Tom and Aaron will tell you, look at the chart. All right, put those upgrades and downgrades on the 
back burner and see what the price action is telling you first and foremost. And I've got one more. Canada Goose Holdings is not having a good day. It had a breakdown there. You can see breaking below support and then kind of a, a rising flag wedge thing and is breaking down. So I would expect that one to continue moving lower. It looks like a continuation break, but it's already down 11%, but it's definitely in bear mode here. So that completes the uh, upgrades and downgrades portion. And there you can see a summary of the symbols that we talked about. And now I'm gonna move on to the presentation portion of this Market Watchers Live. This really is live. Uh, and today what I wanna talk about is, I'm gonna cover the major index ETS and try to put things into perspective, all right? I see a lot of angst out there because people are afraid to miss out. And Greg Schnell talked about in this, his blog, you know, the fear of missing out. And that is an issue to be concerned with. Um, but the thing is, you got to keep in mind the broad market environment, which we think is bearish overall. And as Aaron mentioned, you can have very sharp uh, counter trend rallies. I need to grab the screen back here. Yes. I will grab the screen back and then put it back. I, um, I am taking the questions that are in here for you. Uh, sure, I jump can in. A quick, quick uh, couple of them because I think they're uh, good for it. Uh, one is your thoughts on the dollar versus gold. And the other one is to look at renewable energy versus coal. Those uh, let me think about those ones. Yeah. I'm, I'm not much of a, you know, you got to probably go to Greg Schnell for dollar gold and renewable energy and coal. Right. Um, so let me put those ones on the back burner. Um, but um, let me get that thing back up there. There we go. Uh, basically, the fear of missing out should not override the risk that I think is present in the market right now because the S&P 500 is below the 200 day. I mean, if you look at these four indexes, they kind of summarize what's the current state of the market. All four are below their 200 day moving averages, which you can see right there, the red lines. All four have bearish 50 day, 200 day crossovers there. And yeah, all four are back at their 50 days, but that doesn't mean as much when you're below the 200 day and the 50 days below the 200 day. And so at the very least, it tells you the market environment is above average as far as risk is concerned. And we have to take that into consideration when we are making our investing and trading decisions, probably have to have lower uh, equity positions and higher cash positions. So uh, we've been focused a lot on the short term. Aaron mentioned that that rising wedge uh, pattern, and I'm going to kind of expand on that, show a little more uh, uh, some granularity by looking at a 30 minute chart. But if you look at this uh, 60, this daily chart here, you can see that there's a support level here from that low last week, and we bounced off it twice intraday. So there's clearly something to watch here. And so if we break below 260 in the SPY, that's going to be negative. And I've got RSI hitting that 50 to 60 zone for the third time. It got just above 60, but it's back into that zone. And that's kind of when momentum tends to peter out. And you can see here, if RSI goes back below 50, then that would signal a downturn in momentum. So that's what I'm going to be watching is RSI to move below 50 on several charts. And that would signal that we are turning down. And then there's the uh, rising wedge in the 30, on the 30 minute chart. And the reason I'm picking this wedge is because we're well below this high. It's a counter trend rally. If we're at a new 52 week high, I wouldn't be drawing a wedge. I would just you know, accept it as a 52 week high, but because this is a counter trend rally and you can see we're testing support, we tested it here 
and here. And so if we break 260, then that would signal a continuation lower. But it ain't broken until it's broken. So we look at QQQ, pointed out a evening star pattern. There you can see there's a long white candlestick and then kind of the indecisive candlestick and then a gap down in a black candlestick. But even so, held support there around 161-ish because tried to dip below it. So I think we're going to have to get a close below that or a break below 160 to reverse this uptrend. And there you can see RSI. If it moves below 50, that would confirm. And then, you know, people argue about the direction of the market. Well, a lot of times it depends on time frame, you know, whether you're bullish or bearish or neutral. And there are a lot of different time frames out there. But what I try to do is pick the big time frame and adjust my strategy according to that big time frame. You know, Aaron said, she sees a PMO buy signal, but when the 50 day is below the 200 day, you got to take that with a bit of a grain of salt because that bigger downtrend is the bigger or the dominant force at work. And so, you know, there's all kinds of moving currents in the market. So we've got a bigger downtrend. We've got this uptrend here. And then we had a little pullback in early January and then another breakout. Now we've got a pullback in QQQ. And it looks like we got a short-term breakout working. So this reinforces the support zone. And I would stay bullish short-term on the Qs as long as they hold that support zone. And this little breakout is holding here, but it's very touch and go. And finally, small caps, similar situation. You know, a big move up, still holding on to most of those gains. RSI hasn't moved below 50. So if you look at these three, if two of the three have this RSI moving below 50, that would signal that the downturn is coming. And there you can see IWM's got this little flag wedge breakout short term working. This is a 30 minute chart. This is like a two and a half day wedge. I know it's very short term. I usually don't get that short term. But, you know, since we're in what I think is a bear market environment, I'm, I turn short term. And if you go below 142, then that would reverse that upswing in IWM. So those are three to watch. Now, in this next segment, I want to talk about uh, benchmark levels. So this is the S&P 500. And we're all watching the S&P 500. Well, most of us are watching the S&P 500. It's the most widely followed benchmark for U.S. stocks. It's got the most amount of money benchmark to it, something like, I don't know, $9 trillion. It's watched around the world. The 50-day and the 200-day are watched for this index more than any other moving averages. Aaron watches the 50-day EMA. I do both. I, I've got an SMA on here, and sometimes I use a 50-day SMA. It's just a personal preference. There's no right or wrong answer to that. It's potato, potato, tomato, tomato type thing. But as far as the benchmark highs and lows, first of all, you can see that from October to December, we have a lower low in the S&P 500. Okay. The second thing you can see is here's that December high, and we haven't even gotten up to it. And you can see that this chart isn't updated. So I need to put this to Today, I'll put it on the 24th and update it so we can see the current. And then I'll go back to view all. And for some reason, it keeps reverting back. But we know we're kind of just moving sideways here. So what's happening here is you have a lower low from October to December. So this is a benchmark low. That December low is a lower low. Second, we haven't even moved above the December high. That's a benchmark high. And that's a high and low that I'm going to use to compare on other charts. And then the third thing is, is there's the 52-week high. We're not even close. So when I look at other charts, I keep these levels in mind. And I wonder how these other charts look relative to these benchmark highs and lows I just talked about. Well, if you look at Citigroup, man, what a massive move. It's like 30%. But that's a lower low. 
So it followed the S&P 500, which I've got below. I've got, that's a lower low. So it wasn't performing anything. It wasn't outperforming in December. And even though it's made this big move, it's below its 200 day and it's below that December high and it's well below its 52 week high. So this is not a pretty looking chart despite that 30% advance. So I wouldn't feel bad about missing it. I'm not, I don't go looking for V bottoms. All right. If you're looking for V bottoms, okay, this is something, yeah, you need to study. Uh, but it's just not my kind of uh, a chart. I mean, I can put some hindsight analysis on it and we can see the reversal there with the indecisive candlestick and, and the shot up here and then the follow through breakout there. But that's about it. Now, if you look at Avago or Broadcom, I keep calling it Avago for some reason, but Broadcom bought Avago, I believe, and took over the symbol. It's kind of like calling a Google Alphabet. I still call it Google. But if you look at this compared to Citigroup and compared to the S&P 500, from October to December, you had a higher low. All right, S&P had a lower low. So that's the first positive. That shows less weakness on the downside. Second thing is you've got higher highs. You've got breakouts here. All right, the S&P is not breaking out of corresponding highs. So that's a second plus. And then the third plus is it's not on there, but Avago Broadcom is near a 52 week high and the S&P 500 is not. So those three things tell me that Ova uh, Broadcom is a real leader. And so keep that S&P 500 chart and those benchmark highs and lows in mind when you're looking at other charts and you're trying to separate the leaders from the laggards. So now we're going to move into the tech ETFs. I'm going to look at five industry group ETFs related to technology. And the first one is cloud computing. And you know, you look at the benchmark low there and you can see, well, we did have a lower low from October to December. So no big deal there. Uh, but you can see that this ETF got all the way back to that December high and briefly above its 200 day. So it's stronger than the S&P 500. It's overbought. It's at resistance. Yes, but it is stronger than the S&P 500. You know, maybe you got some sort of reversal working here. The First level to watch might be 51.5. And if RSI moves below 50, uh, but that's a form of relative strength because it got all the way to that high. In contrast, you look at hack, all right? Hack didn't make it back to this high or to the 200 day moving average. It's still a little bit short, but it's still performing all right. It's still got its uptrend working here. And you know, one thing about this uptrend, if you go short term, then you know where your risk is, you know, close below 35 and you got to be out. But as long as it holds, this uptrend is working and heading for a challenge, but it's not as strong as sky. And then you look at FDN. All right. You can see that it broke above. This is the first trust internet ETF. It broke above that December high that the S&P 500 couldn't break above and it's holding a little bit. It's trying to reverse, but it hasn't quite reversed yet. At the minimum, a move below, say, 126 would be required. Probably a better support would be this low here from mid-December. If you break that, then that's going to be a reversal. So you watch these tech ETFs and you see which ones break. And the more that break, the more valid any kind of reversal in tech would be. But look at SOX. As Aaron mentioned, the SOX is just off to the races. You can see this resistance zone it's coming into. But look at that gap up and that big surge. All right, I was watching support here. And yeah, be honest, I was, I was expecting a break because the bigger trend was down because I lean in the direction of the bigger trend. But uh, I've been wrong so far on this one. And now the gap is the place to watch and the support level here. But now we got a big challenge to resistance. Software is performing quite well because you can see it's already back to that December high where the S&P 500 is not. And if you wanna draw a little pattern, maybe, maybe you got some sort of a flag working here and you watch for a little break out there.
So now let's look at some of the components of the semiconductor ETF. And what I did was I just Googled here, SOX Holdings, and you can put in ETF, but I went to the iShares website and you can see the holdings there and you can download them in a CSV file and you can put them in a chart list at stock charts and you can follow all the components. But what's good about this is, is you can see who are the biggest holdings and look Broadcom, Intel, Texas Instruments, the biggest holdings, Nvidia, Qualcomm, and then it drops off. You go from like seven and a half percent down to four. And you got Taiwan, Xilinx, Analog, NXP, and AMD. So what I did was I created this chart list to look at these and see what who is leading, all right, in the semiconductor group. And I already showed Broadcom at the beginning. So on this chart, I'll show you how I've got it set up and then go back. But I like to see where the 52-week high and 52-week low is on a chart. And so what I've done is I've got the 255-day price channels. And that's roughly one year. I think it's 252, 253 days. So I kind of go to a little bit extra, go 255 days. And I put it in pink. Uh, and you can also sh do this as area, and it shows a nice area marking the 52-week high low range. And I'm going to go ahead and update that so you can see what happens. So that's what area looks like. So you see the when you go below and make a 52-week low, and then when you go above and you make a 52-week high. It's always nice to uh, know which stocks are making 52-week highs because they are the clear leaders. So here's Intel, and one of the biggest components in the semiconductor group. And if we look at our benchmark low here from October to December, so S&P was hitting a lower low, Intel a higher low. All right, you can see that December high in the S&P. And there is the December high in Intel. It hasn't gotten to it quite yet, but you know it's breaking out of a consolidation here. All right, you had the big surge, consolidation, and it's breaking out and above the 200 days. So Intel is showing some leadership here. Texas Instruments, it held up better when the market was falling apart, you got a slightly higher low from October to December. And there's that December high and we're right at it. So it's outperforming. You know, this is a pretty sloppy consolidation. You don't always get a nice falling flag or a wedge or a pennant to play. Uh, and with earnings, you know, this is what happens. You get a, a downdraft two days earlier and then you get a surge after earnings. So this is just the nature of the beast. Uh, NVIDIA. And this is kind of one of these conundrum stocks that we'll be talking about that I would put in the list that Aaron and I are going to talk about later. You know, it's showing strength, but it's in a long-term downtrend. I mean, look at that. That's clearly a long-term downtrend, way oversold. So we got an oversold bounce underway. So you could, you know, maybe mark some support here if you want to, you know, hold NVIDIA short term. Maybe it gets back to this gap zone as a guesstimate for a rally. But, you know, you can see it hit a lower low with the S&P 500. So it didn't show relative strength in December. And it's not showing relative strength now because it's below, well below that December high. So it's not one of the leaders. Qualcomm, clearly one of the laggards. All right, so it's not uh, lifting all boats here, this move in semis. Uh, we see basically a triangle, a big sharp move lower and a triangle and a continuation break. And then we have Taiwan Semiconductor. And you can see this one lower lows and below the December high. So pass, you know, ugly chart. And this one was already leading, heading into earnings. So look at this from October to December, you had a higher low, right? And there's that December high, you were right at it. 
last week and then with earnings surged above it. But, you know, Xilinx gave a signal with a, a channel breakout in early January because it was already leading because it held well above that October low and the 200 day when the market was falling apart. And analog devices, ADI was holding up pretty well during the market decline, and now it's moving above its December high. So it is a leader relative to what we see on the S&P 500. Man, how many stocks do I have here? This is the last one, just kidding. I put the whole group in my chart list, but I'm only going to look at the top 10 because it could drown on for a long time. But NXP, yeah, nothing special here. Lower low, so it wasn't outperforming. It's near the December high, and it does have a consolidation breakout working. Uh, so it's maybe one to put on the watch list, but it's not as strong as the first ones that I showed. So we see that semiconductors are surging, and, and that should be good for QQQ. So let's see how this relates to QQQ, because it's semi, QQQ is not just semiconductors. There are a lot of other stocks in QQQ. So I went to the Invesco website to look at the top holdings. You can see it's very top heavy. Microsoft 10%, Apple 9%. Um, this is information technology. And if you go down, because of the new system, you have Alphabet in the communication services sector. And it's twice because it's got two classes of stock, but it's over 8% of the ETF. And Facebook is 4%. And Netflix is just 2%. So it's a fairly small holding. So we saw what was happening with QQQ. And I went ahead and put the top 10 components here so we could see you know, who was looking good and who wasn't. And you know, Microsoft, believe it or not, doesn't look that good. You know, it was really looking good when it held the 200-day there, but it broke the 200-day ultimately, and it hit a lower low, so it wasn't showing relative chart strength. And then you can see that December high, so it's not showing relative strength here either. It's in the midst of a, a, a counter trend advance that looks a bit like a, a rising wedge, but, you know, as long as support holds there, you give it the benefit of the doubt on this bounce. Amazon doesn't look that great either. You can see lower lows with the market. And there's the December high. It's not at it. And it gapped down from its 200 day there. So there's clearly a support level here at 1600. And that's the level to watch. If you close below that, then that would weigh on the market. And especially the appropriate sectors. Apple looks terrible. I mean, that is barely a bounce. So look at this from October to December, and this weighed heavily on the market because Apple is still one of the biggest, if not the biggest stock. And what we had here is, looks like a little wedge and we're breaking down. So that's not even the early December high. Apple couldn't even get above its late December high. It's really showing a lot of weakness, Apple. Here's Alphabet, and it doesn't look that good either. So you can see, even though semiconductors are surging and there are pockets of strength, there are some really serious pockets of weakness still in the market with some ugly charts. So it's not that great of a broad market environment. There's that October to December low, lower low. There's that December high. Didn't challenge it. So Google's an underperformer, some sort of a, a wedge working here. Now, as far as the trend line is concerned, the wedge line, the steepness marks kind of the rate of change. It's kind of the momentum. The steeper the trend line, the more upside momentum. So a break just tells you there's a change in momentum. But the last demand point was right here around 1,050 when it pulled back, demand came in, buying pressure pushed it back up above 1,100. So now if the sellers push it below 1050, that would mark a victory from on supply 
and a challenge, maybe a break below a thousand. And Facebook, kind of one of these conundrum stocks. There's a lot of these conundrum stocks out there. It wasn't hard to find them because, you know, look at that from October to December, lower lows, underperforming, but it did get above that high. So it's showing a little bit of relative strength here in January, but it's below the 200 day. And it's just not that great, great of a, it's not that good looking of a chart. You know, I'd rather have a steady uptrend than pick a bottom here. I, I think that would be bottom picking. And we already covered Intel. And I think the last two would be Cisco systems. And this chart kind of looks like XLV, believe it or not. Kind of have these two highs here. And then you have the support break. So it's like a double top. But then you surge back into this zone here and got another one of these. Wedges are all over the place, man. But as long as the wedge rises, technically you have an uptrend. So maybe you got a support at that 200 day. So you close below 44 and you've reversed this upswing here. But, you know, really, when you look at Cisco, here we are, May 2018, and we're just above that May high. I've gone nowhere for about seven months. And then Comcast. Oh, the joy of earnings. Jeez. You know, expecting a bad report, so you get a sell-off. You get a good report, so you get big buying, and then you get some sort of news, and you get more selling. I mean, this is supposed to be a dull stock. Uh, it is above the 200-day, but we can see that lower low there. So it was as weak as the market from October to December, even though it got above this high in between. Uh, but I would mark this as a, another wedge and watch for a support break there. So when you look at QQQ, the components are mixed at best and, and favoring the negative. Uh, I think more than that. I think the odds favor QQQ moving lower. So get out there and change your vote on the S&P 500. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one more, PepsiCo. Um, this is consumer staple, but it is part of QQQ. All right, you can see up there, I put the percentage in my title. 2.16% of QQQ is Pepsi. And let me change that little drawing thing there. But a lot of support here, right at the 200-day and that September-October low. So uh, just keep an open mind on this one. You know, if you, you break out to the upside here, that's going to be bullish. Uh, the bearish alternative, and I was looking at this already. I think they have earnings in mid-February. But you have a sharp decline, could be a pennant. And if you break that, then that would uh, signal a continuation lower for Pepsi. But, you know, it's not really a big tech. It's, it's a consumer staple, so it might act different than the ones we've been talking about that are related to technology. So um, you had a question at the beginning, Aaron, I on did. the dollar and gold. Okay. Well, yeah, what's your, your opinion on those? Well, right I needed to, to talk for 20 minutes and kind of think on the side before, <laughs> before I did that. You know, <laughs> That's called buying time. You know, yep. when you re repeat the question and then you pretend to not hear it. And, and well, here's your summary slide is up, but uh, go ahead and take the screen if you want to show your gold. And, uh, okay. Uh, well, I, yeah, a lot of people do uh, follow gold and, and it's, it's been uh, one of the better performers. Uh, over the past uh, few months, which is is saying something. Um, so we'll just do the gold uh, ETF, GLD. And I'll put the dollar in the bottom so we can um, compare those directly. And I'm just going to use the dollar ETF. And I'm going to put them even height because, you know, they are equal. And I think uh, the dollar is the biggest influence on gold and i'm going to put these as thick high low close bars 
and we'll go ahead and add a 200 day. And here's a nifty little trick. You try 200 colon and you can put in a color. You can see I like to use red for my 200. So you can change the color of your moving average in the indicator window when you're adding an indicator to an indicator. And look at that. I had a typo. <laughs> so I'll just add a U to that. And I'm happy they didn't take away my symbol. So what we can see here is, well, look at the dollar. I mean, I think the dollar's in a long-term uptrend. So, you know, you look at this move that we've had in gold, and yeah, it's definitely impressive. And it's come, some of it, when the dollar was moving higher. So it's kind of like a the ultimate safe haven. Uh, but, you know, you got to be careful because the dollar's in an uptrend. It's above its rising 200-day moving average. And this, I think, uh, I would get my bias based on the longer term picture. And it looks like it's breaking out of a channel here. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at gold, if you didn't see the dollar, you'd be more bullish on gold. But you see this surge and the consolidation. But within that consolidation, and yeah, you really don't have gaps in gold because it's reacting to the futures market. Carl Swindon pointed this out to me years ago. Um, so gold is, you know, traded round the clock. It's traded in Asia and then Europe and then the U.S. reacts to all that trading. So you can't really mine the uh, gaps there. But, you know, the dollar's stuck in a consolidation. Uh, the gold is in a consolidation. And with the dollar breaking up to the upside, I would watch out for gold breaking to the downside here, I'd have to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been uh, interesting because, you know, being bearish, uh, you know, the expectation is, of course, that gold is going to be the place to be. But I've been having that conundrum, I suppose, uh, because it is, you know, could be a flag. But every, you know, the momentum, my, my PMO is very oversold. And then, yeah, the, the dollar is trying to break out here and is in a rising trend. So it's you know, they do tend to travel with that, you know, reverse uh, correlation, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting because mm -hmm. also, yeah, if you're bearish, you would expect to see gold do well and the dollar not so well, but. Well, there's your PMO. Look at that. Exactly. And that's, that's the problem I have. And of course I'm holding it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but gold hasn't broken down. Exactly. Uh, I, I have my, my alert in, in case it does break, yeah. down or break down there, which honestly, I'm kind of expecting it to do, which is why it's like, well, why don't you just sell it now? <laughs> so are you saying you, you get the warning from the indicator, but you act based on the price chart? Yes. Yeah, that makes so, sense. Yeah. So it got me in at the right time. But uh, now it's, uh, you know, I saw yeah. the PMO start to turn over nice. in a spot territory and it's like, well, <laughs> that's, I know Carl, usually when he starts to see that reversal in trend, that's when, or in the momentum, that's usually when he uh, lets go. But I've noticed plenty of times where that doesn't really matter so much. So I'm, I'm paying close attention. If it drops below, if it breaks down below that consolidation range, then. Yeah, it's a well-defined range. Exactly. Over the last uh, three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. So, no, we'll see how it goes. But, all right. Well, I do have, um, we didn't, let's see. Uh, yeah, I didn't have any others. I don't, as far as questions um, for you. Um, lots of compliments on your analysis. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, somebody <laughs> asked about coal, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Renewable energy versus coal. Uh, what is the renewable energy ETF? Um, is there one? There is. Uh, I know that the industry group is like Dow Jones uh, or DW Cree, C-R-E. -E. So Cree, maybe that's it. No, that's a different company. Here, renewable energy group. <laughs> there we go. There see, we that's go. how you can do it right there. Arthur, yeah, you see, you. I started typing in the name uh, and you get a pre-filled list there. And I would like a, an ETF, but we'll just try REGI. Or I can look at, the, at all the results. 
that have the word renewable in them. And the renewable energy, is that what you're talking about there? Yeah, that one. There we go. All right. So I'll copy that symbol over. Because that one's having will... the, it's like one of the best performers right now as far as indus industry groups. Okay. And we will compare it to coal. So there are a couple of ways that you can do this comparison here. Um, now, how did that happen? I thought I copied the symbol. All right, so we're going to go back to the results. Dollar DW Cree. Mm, yeah, I thought you spelled it right. And I will. You can also click on, did you notice that? You see all these little icons to the left here when you're searching. So you got a sharp chart, you've got a gallery view, a PNF chart, seasonality chart. And if you want more information about that symbol, you can click on it. So this is a valid symbol. So if I click on that, I'll get my default sharp chart. And so I can just add coal to the bottom. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two other things here. All right, I'm going to add this symbol here, DW Cree, and I'm going to do a relative performance to coal. I know it's an index versus an ETF, so maybe it's not an exact, but I want to see how they perform. And I'm going to do a correlation to see if there's a correlation between coal and, you know, you expect a negative correlation, but you never know until you actually chart it. And I'll go ahead and make that chart just a little bit bigger so we can see those indicator windows a little bit better. And so if we look at the renewable energy ETF, you can see that it is trying to break out of some sort of a bottoming formation. So, you know, you got two lows there and you got an intermittent high. So it's a bit of a double bottom. And you can see it's, it's trying to break above that high. It fell back, but now it's pushing back above it. So, you know, it looks like it's ready to challenge a 200 day. And if you use the classic double bottom, you would measure from say 60 to 75, and that would imply a 15 point advance. So from 75, that would take you to 90. And that dotted pink line is the mid midpoint between the 52 week high and 52 week low. It's my 255 day price channel. There's the 52 week high and there's the 52 week low. So that would be the target based on this double bottom breakout. And you can see coal is underperforming. Coal has the, the lower low. So you wouldn't want to be in coal. You'd want to be in this one if you had to choose the two. There you can see the price relative. It's got a higher low relative to coal. And it did get above that high, so it's turning up. And funny enough, there's a positive correlation, but... That we'll doesn't figure. look so positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but one thing about it is, is you can probably find the components by going to the sector summary. So if I do this information, I can see that it is in this industry group. The first quote was 2012. And I would have to go to the sector summary and drill down. So if you go to charts and tools at the top left, and then you scroll down to the right, see summary pages, I'm gonna go to sector summary. And I would imagine that is in industrials. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Let's so, um, but you're going to have to go through, even if we don't find this one, now you've seen how you can drill down from the sectors and see the industry groups within the sectors. And I could go to energy as well. I'll try that one. But what's also neat about once you're in there, there it is at the top yeah. here, renewable energy. And so I can click on that and I can see all the stocks that are in this renewable energy group. 
And there you can see some links over on the left if you want to see different charts. And you can do a different sort. And there is an RRG link at the bottom. I'll click that. Now that's just going to be the sector RRG. But you could put these in a chart list and then put them in an RRG to see some relative strength. Excellent. Uh, well, you know, the 10 and 10, we've already passed that whole segment, so we're going to have to move quickly. Oh, and I'll geez, still sorry, do the 10 and 10. No worries. No worries. Everybody <laughs> wanted to see that. Uh, so I will go ahead and do the market. Uh, let's see. We'll do the market update after the 10 and 10, so it'll be a little late, guys. But we'll go ahead and just start into that 10 and 10. Uh, I do have an RRG, uh, but I don't feel like we have time. Let's just go right on into. Um, so just basically, uh, Arthur's going to show you how you can, you know, have a chart list and quickly, you know, populate it with annotations. So. Um, okay, I'm going to MWL, mm -hmm. MWK, and I'll just preface this with a bunch of zeros so it's at the top of my chart list. So right. now you see, oh, there's some others at the top. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the first one is KO Coca-Cola. Okay, this is probably going to look a bit like Pepsi. And I just clicked add to add that chart. And I can just click on the symbol to analyze it. It's in the chart list. Now, what's interesting about this one is it's one of these conundrum stocks already. Because uh, the long-term trend is up. You're above the 200-day, and the 200-day is rising. But you can see you had a bit of a breakdown there. And I'm going to go back to the straight line where you broke support. And, God, how many rising wedges have we seen? I know. Uh, a bit of a rising wedge there. So if it breaks down here, it could test these lows here around 44. Uh, but I wait for the break. All right, next one. All right, excellent. Let's see. The most popular in the chat room is A R R Y. A R R Y. So that would be a nice, volatile biotech. All right. <laughs> so uh, clearly, I don't know why I keep choosing that arrow, but there we go. A lot of support there around 13. And it's not a double bottom, but there you can see it pierced that high. So it got a higher high, big surge and a breakout. It's not a picture perfect flag, but you know, this is a consolidation after a sharp surge. And a consolidation usually goes in the direction of the prior move. So the bet would be for this one to break out and move higher and challenge, if not break, to a new 52 week high. All righty. And I'm not annotating these right, am I? <laughs> no, it's, you can go back later if you want. <laughs> okay, I'll, I will annotate the next one the normal way. Right. I have this right. little screen drawing program that is really quick, but the next one will be done the different way. Okay. Uh, and that's FireEye, F-E-Y-E. -E. Yeah, this one is uh, a bit of a disappointment, but it, whenever it disappoints, it seems to do something else. So basically, you know, fire eye broke down here and I like a, a little bit thicker trend line. So I'm going to grab it and thicken the line there. And then you can see, I'm going to go ahead and grab a shape. So you break support here, but then it firms and now it's breaking above resistance and you can't see those. So I have to recolor them. So there's green for support and there's red for resistance. So FireEye, you know, I think there's better stocks out there like Palo Alto, uh, because if you look at this chart, it's below the April high. So it's really not in an uptrend, even though it's breaking out here. Uh, you know, if you're more aggressive, you can pick the break back above the 200 day here, but I don't see it as being in an uptrend. But short term, a breakout. Okay, let's see. There's ML. Okay. There you go. Next up is, uh, I think you might be familiar with this, uh, Apple. Yeah, APL. <laughs> it is one of the uglier looking charts out there. I mean, you see break below the 200 day. 
and didn't even look back. It bounced there and then had a gap down. And as I showed you before, this looks like a bearish flag, wedge, whatever you want to call it. It really doesn't matter. It's a, a sharp decline and a counter trend bounce, and we're breaking down out of that wedge. So this is a bearish pattern right now. All righty. Next one up, uh, let's see, GWPH, and that is GW Pharmaceuticals. Okay. So going nowhere. You can see the 52-week low there is at 90, and the 52-week high is at 180. And this dotted pink line is the in between the 52-week high and low. And we're right in the middle of a choppy range. So if you look at the swings within the range, okay, you know, we've got a breakout of some sort. Not sure where to mark resistance there. Uh, but we do have a breakout of sorts. But, you know, if you look at the bigger picture, it's a choppy range. And so it wouldn't be one of my favorite charts to trade. All righty. Let's see. The next one I have for you is CVNA. And what is that one? C -V -N -A. That is a Carvana. So C-V-N-A. Carvana. Yes. All right. Let's see. We have a full quote uh, window button there that I'm clicking. And I'm going to click Update. So we can see a little bit more. It's consumer discretionary and it's a specialty retailer. It's obviously not any place you're shopping, right? Right. <laughs> I've never shopped there either. So <laughs> no. I have no idea. I've what not they... been in the I've not been looking for a car for years, so <laughs> Oh, you even got Carvana. I didn't even pick that up. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, it's it's in a downtrend, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, this is kind of a counter trend bounce at this point. Yeah, it's it's looking okay for a few weeks, but over the several months, it's not looking that great. So I would expect, you know, resistance uh, probably in this consolidation zone or around the 200 day. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. The next one is for our Canadian friends. Okay. And it is a consumer staple. And the symbol is JWEL.TO. Jewelry, maybe. Yeah. Jameson. It says household goods. Uh, Jameson Wellness. Okay. So uh, another conundrum stock. And the reason it is because you can see some short term positives, but you clearly see long term negatives. Uh, because, you know, it broke down here below support there. It's below the 200-day. must be an IPO because the 200-day didn't start. Sorry, I don't know Canadian stocks that well. And, you know, then it had the, the, the surge after becoming very oversold, and now it's got kind of a triangle working. So, it you know, it might be ready for a, a shorter-term bounce out of the triangle, but I'd expect resistance in that 24 area from broken support and oh. possibly the 200 day. All right. You're just flying. You're doing great. <laughs> um, Prudential Financial will be our next one. All P right. R -U. So Pru is in a downtrend. You know, that's the first thing you look at. That's why I put the 200 day on there. It was hitting 52 week lows way back in April, April, May, June, October, November, December, late December. And then like all financials had the rally of its life. But despite that rally, there's that December high. So it hasn't challenged that December high yet. And it hit a lower low there, and it's nowhere near, 52 week high isn't even on the chart. There's the midpoint of the high low range at 99. The 52 week high is at 122. So, 
yeah, this one's come too far too fast. And there's a big, big zone here that probably will act as resistance soon. So I'd stay away from Prudential. Okay. The next one is going to be a mat applied materials. Yep. Part of the, it's a semiconductor equipment stock. And it's acting like some of the better semiconductor stocks. Uh, we can see the lower low October to December. And then we can see the December high. So it hasn't broken out yet. You know, this is kind of a prove it to me first. Uh, I would rather be a, you know, waiting for the breakout and then buy on the, you know, looking for the next pullback. It's not my style to, you know, buy off of a 52 week low, the first bounce basically, because it's still an overall downtrend. And there comes the downward sloping 200 day. So bear market bounce is my assessment there. All right. And one more, and uh, I'm not familiar with this one. Um, it is VT, VT, and it's VTV Therapeutics uh, Biotech. VT twice? Yes. Victor Thomas? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, this one looks like an all or nothing kind of stock. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's gone from one to three. So it's basically tripled what? Yeah. Um, you know, we got a nice percentage change tool that you can use here. So there it is. 250%. <laughs> it was up. So not for the faint at heart. Ooh, yeah, I don't think I could trade that. Uh, just... This is an option, right? Basically. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't expire until it goes to zero. Right. Um, but you look at the, you know, okay, put some technicals on it. Um, it's above the 200 day. This is a massive surge. This is a, a pennant and it's breaking out of the pennant. Um, so, you know, if you got some money that you can lose, <laughs> lose is the key word here. You know, if you're, you've got a thick skin and, and you can afford to lose it, you know, this is a, a bullish breakout. Uh, but it could, you know, be below two before the blink of an eye. Uh, but I would give this a bullish vote. All righty. And that does complete the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that we just went over. over. Uh, when Arthur sends me that list, I will get those charts as he annotated them up in the Market Watchers Live chart, chart list. And you can find the link to that. Just go to the Market Watchers Live blog from the blogs articles tab. And then right there at the top is going to be the link to the live chart list. And then they are always in the uh, Market Watchers Live recaps. All right, let's take a look at what the market's been doing real quick, and then we're going to get into some chart conundrums. All right, and away we go. Well, you can see we've had quite a volatile day, I would say. We've been moving mostly sideways, but in a, a pretty um, deep channel there. It looks like we had a double top here on, in the short term. These are 10-minute bar charts. Uh, we did get a, a double top here. And I would expect, you know, we got the breakdown through the confirmation line. So we should see lower prices continuing. We've got a double top that's set up here on the NASDAQ. So based on what I'm seeing with the Dow and the S&P, I would expect that to break down. Uh, S&P 400 and Russell 2000 were the indexes that were performing uh, well. Uh, they still are the better performers today. The Russell 2000 is up 0.3% uh, currently. Uh, TSX mostly unchanged right now, but it has pulled back just like the U.S. markets have. Treasury yields moving lower, 2.701% right now. We can see the volatility index is now starting to rise as the markets are starting to move lower. And currently we have a reading just above 20 at 2017. UUP making a huge move to the upside right now. It is at 2567. And you can see GLD similarly is moving lower, but uh, percentage wise, it doesn't look uh, quite as bad, but I have to look at that on a chart. USO is rising, but it's pulling back just slightly right now at 1116. And TLT, big gap up, consolidated, and now we're 
off to the races yet again. That's 121.23 for TLT. And that's all I have for today's final market update. Let's go ahead and we have about 10 minutes or so to get into the chart conundrums. And I'm just going to go ahead and start so you can rest your voice a little. Sure. You go ahead and run yeah. through a few of yours. and uh, Right. So what I did, it's, I think it's going to be a little bit of a different tack than, than the way you went. But I went and found some chart patterns and wanted to look at those to see what to expect uh, based on those patterns. And the conundrum is, for example, let's look at Goodyear. All right. The conundrum will be, and you can see what happened earlier, we had a nice double bottom. We were in a declining trend. Um, so it was oh, looking good, right? You're going to get that move to, to hopefully get to the confirmation line. That's your expectation. If you were watching here, we had the PMO buy signal and it was rising. So it looked really like it was going to do the right thing. Well, obviously it has not. And this is an example of when I say uh, to expect uh, bearish outcomes when you have a bearish setup as far as where the 50 is in regard to the 200 day EMA. So that was one I had. And let's see, this is another double bottom that I was looking at. Currently, we have one setting up here, but not really. Um, one of the things that I think, Arthur, you will agree now, sometimes they do execute, even though they're not. Uh, these are reversal patterns, double bottoms and double tops are reversal patterns. And so to get one off of an uptrend, it's not truly a double bottom pattern. So it's a little tricky there, but you could easily draw in a pennant here. And that's a continuation pattern. And even though we got the breakdown, looks like we're coming back up on that. And I, I do have to say, I like the uh, PMO buy signal lining up on this one. Yeah, it's showing some relative strength, you know, with that new high in October. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The 50 day EMA is held. We got the uh, five, uh, five day, 20 day EMA. Um, crossover, which is a short-term trend model buy signal for decision point. So, uh, of course, you've got the uh, overhead resistance sitting here pretty close at $39. Let's see another one that I had. Let's look at uh, United Rentals. All right. And this one, I was just looking at a, a various um, things that were going on here. Back here, you can see uh, we had what looked like a nice double bottom mm -hmm. shaping up. And we never hit the confirmation line. And again, the 50 was below the 200. So even though this was shaping up to be a bullish pattern off of a downtrend, uh, the expectation, while it's to the upside off of this pattern, because we were in such a bearish configuration, it didn't execute as expected. Right now, we look like we've broken out of a possibly out of a kind of a messy flag. Uh, but we might have a breakout right here off of, uh, like I said, kind of a messy flag. Uh, the PMO is rising. So, but we're right at that 125 level. And that was the sticking point back here, the end of November, beginning of December. So I'd want the breakout personally, if I were to get back, uh, get involved. And let's see, I'm going to look at this one. I think it had a couple of examples right now. So we have a flag. And it does appear to be executing. The 50 is above the 200, so I can expect um, I can expect a continuation. And flags typically are a continuation pattern. Yeah. So uh, that was one. And then everybody likes to look at Facebook. And then I'm going to pass it to you for the final. So I this mean the one Facebook is Facebook chart, not Facebook. Right. Yeah. No, I won't check out. <laughs> Nobody wants to see my Facebook. <laughs> No, I didn't mean your Mark Facebook. Watchers Live Facebook page anytime you want. So here's another setup. We had a downtrend, right? We had the, the double bottom shape up. We even made it past the confirmation line, uh, but we failed and came back down. However, we're now coming back, back down, testing the 20 and 50. And if we can hold above that, maybe we've got a flag going on here. But... 50 is well below the 200. So I would, as uh, you said earlier, I'd take it with a grain of salt. And especially when I look at a PMO that's topping like it is. So those were some of the ones that I found just as far as, you know, when you see these patterns, just be careful, you know, that, that you're not looking at a reversal pattern in the wrong place or that you're putting too much emphasis on a bullish pattern when you have a bearish configuration. Yes. Yeah. That's my big thing is a bullish pattern in a bearish configuration. 
Exactly. So okay. go ahead, take well, the screen, show us yours. That's a good segue because that's pretty much my next, uh, that's the one I'm going to cover is, you know, when you're in a, a bigger downtrend and you get a surge and a short-term bullish pattern, you know, it pre presents a conundrum because personally, I like to be in the direction, positioned in the direction of the bigger trend. So if the bigger trend is up, I like to be looking for bullish setups and bullish opportunities. If the bigger trend is down, I either want to be out or looking for bearish setups. And if you look at, you know, oil here, what is USO? You can't really use it for longer term analysis, but, you know, short term, that's a big surge. And there's some sort of a flag or pin it working and it's breaking out. So, you know, short term, I see the, the positives here that point to uh, higher prices in oil. But when I look at it longer term, you know, there you can see there's that falling 200 day. I know this is USO, um, but, you know, there's a resistance there from those December highs. So I would be, you know, very careful here because if oil breaks, you know, that support level, it could continue lower because I think the longer term trend is down. And then I'm seeing, you know, some of these home builders are giving me the conundrum syndrome, if we want to call it that. You know, this is DR Horton. And you can see a, a double bottom working here. I'll just go to the stock charts annotate instead of using that other thing that I was using. If you see the two lows there, pretty much matching up. And there you can see the resistance. You broke above it, and then there's a throwback. So this may be less conundrum than, and then you can maybe see a flag, and you say, well, come on, look at the steepness of those trend lines. Well, I got a nifty little trick to uh, change the steepness of your trend lines. You just change the dates, the months on your chart. So I'll just go to three, and lo and behold, we have a different looking chart. In fact, I'll just go to two. No, let's go to one. Let's just focus on the advance and the pullback. So those trend lines look really steep when I was looking at a one-year chart. But when I change it to a one-month chart, there's the... Um, so it looks like a bull flag. So, you know, there's that double top breakout, double bottom breakout. There's the move. And there's the bull flag and we're turning up. So the good thing about this one is, is you do have a pretty well-defined risk point, you know, below uh, 35 there. But the conundrum part is you're below the 200 day, the 200 day is falling. And like two months ago, you had a 52 week low there. So that's where you get the conundrum with DR Horton. And you got a similar situation in, in General Electric. You know, this is just a chart I wouldn't even look twice at. You know, I just bring it up for the conundrum because, you know, it has a little double bottom. That's a pretty small double bottom, actually, and a breakout and a little consolidation. But I think it needs some time to uh, base before it can even be looked at. And definitely not when the broader market environment is bearish. Home Depot is part of that home building group. All right. You can see the, the conundrum as well. It's not a, it's weaker than uh, DR Horton. DR Horton's one of the stronger ones. All right. But, you know, Home Depot had the surge and then it had this kind of pullback here. So maybe there's some sort of a bullish pennant, but it's a bullish pattern within a bigger downtrend. So that's why I would pass on it, even though you got the gap. You know, I prefer to have that bigger trend in my favor. And to give you an example of something that has the bigger trend in its favor, if you look at ABV, you know, it's lower highs, 52-week low, and it had this surge, and then it's got this triangle. But you can see that that triangle doesn't look like you're going to get a breakout, right? It looks like you're going to get a breakdown. That's the way it is with consolidation. Sometimes they don't break the way you think they're going to break. 
Um, so it looks like you break 84, AbV is going to head to new lows. And a lot of pharmaceuticals are getting hit today. I noticed Merck was under pressure. And then the airlines, the airlines don't look good. All right, this is a clear downtrend here for American Airlines. And you can see it's just a consolidation within a downtrend. So this is not a conundrum. The only conundrum is shorting or puts. You know, you never know when you're going to get a rally. So I think uh, we're winding down here. I have to give it back to Aaron at this stage. Fine. No, it's time to sort of wrap this all up. You know, we didn't uh, look at the poll. Uh, I don't know if we can get that uh, available. Uh, if you haven't taken it, though, go ahead and do that. It's been absolutely great to have you on the show. Here's our summary of the symbols that we did look at as far as our conundrums go. Uh, so go, go ahead and look at those charts. See if you see what we're seeing. And maybe that'll give you a, a, a little bit of a feel of some of the things you should consider when it's time to go in and you know make these decisions, uh, trade decisions. I mean, admittedly, I've gotten a little bit back into the market, but uh, in the you know staples, utilities, uh, those sorts of um, defensive areas, because I still I'm on the I'm still on defense. I don't know about you, Arthur. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly on the sidelines. Um, so there you can see the poll results. Uh, zero to 5% is the winner, 41%. 30%, 5 to 10%. We got a lot of bears out there. Yes. Well, they're, they're in the right place. So I think the, the, question <laughs> the, bears, the question the bears that voted have to ask themselves is, are they contrarian or not? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, if you're contrarian. <laughs> sentiment. <laughs> I've got sentiment to definitely cover. I might just do that as a little bonus tomorrow since I'm actually co-hosting on Friday. And There you go. I, I do want to make a quick announcement, too, for the Decision Point faithful out there uh, and those who should be introduced to it. Carl Swenlin, my father, has agreed to start doing the Decision Point show every week. So you'll get uh, two for the price of one, which is, you know, of course, there is no cost. <laughs> but... <laughs> we'll both be there um, to give that you our great opinion. news. Carl, isn't that got crazy? Some, yeah, yeah. You got to listen to Carl. Yeah, I can't even believe that he uh, agreed to do it every week. But I think he's just having so much fun with it, and he loves to read your uh, survey comments, guys. So anytime uh, he's on, feel free to certainly put uh, comments in those surveys as well. So, yeah. And when does your show uh, air, Arthur? So On Trend is Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and repeats at 11 a.m. Eastern. And then it is archived on YouTube. Yay. Sounds great. Okay. Well, um, goodness, it's actually time to wrap it up. Uh, looks like the chat room, we did cover pretty much um, most of it. Uh, somebody did mention a, something about a bull trap, uh, maybe something to consider for our shows coming up. <laughs> Uh, what we're thinking about a bull trap right now. I have to say, like I said, I'm very bearish. Uh, you know, that that's that's all I can say. Uh, short term, I'm sort of mixed, uh, but we'll see. I have to go look at those indicators again after the close. All right, guys. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Especially. Thanks for having me. Yes, especially you. Uh, pre please remember to complete that survey as you exit. It's right below the viewer. And we love to get that feedback uh, to let us know what you think of Market Watchers Live and all of that. Um, it airs Mon Market Watchers airs Monday through Fridays from noon to 1.30. Have a great afternoon and happy trading. Bye-bye. <laughs>